Welcome back. If you'll grab your folder, please, and turn to number 23, a song we don't sing all that often. Jesus Christ is all to the tune of Hark the Herald. And notice that uh, the third and fourth uh, verses do go over into page number 24. We'll sing all four together. So if you found number 23, please stand with me and let's sing it together. a lot of energy to sing that song. Let's open our Bibles for a little reading, please, to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19. I 
account that you know the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Christ and he asked him what must he do to inherit eternal life. Jesus told him to keep the law. He said, I've done that. So then Jesus touched what was important to the man. He said, go and sell everything you have. Give it to your neighbor. Because the scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. So the young man went away. That's the key. He went away. And went away sorrowful before he had great possessions. So then I want you to look with me in verse 23 where we take up our reading. And I'll refer back to this. But Matthew 19 verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples. Verily or truly I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. And the reason they were amazed is because the background of their theology was that God blessed people to have riches. So a rich man surely was one who could and would be saved. And so they ask at the end of verse 25, who then can be saved? And Jesus beheld them, looked them in the eyes, and he said unto them, with men... This is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Join me in prayer. Father, we pray for those who are not with us today, those who may be watching by live streaming, those who may hear our worship by radio. We pray that you would take your word not only to our hearts, but to theirs. Would you take your word and call your sheep to yourself and honor and glorify your own son? We pray for those who are ill today, not with us, those who are traveling, those who may be recovering from one thing or another, or those who are working. We pray that in all things you would take care of them and may they know of your presence. May you warm our hearts with your word today and instruct us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, grab your hymn books, please. Turn to number 343. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We'll sing all five stanzas together. If you found 343, please stand with me and let's sing it together. <clears throat>
shining as the sun with no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun I need to remind you, and I made a grievous error last week. I said that we were going to have our Thanksgiving dinner December the 19th. And uh, my memory bank told me that I had said December, but Thanksgiving occurs in November. So it would be November the 19th. That would be two weeks from today. Is that right? Today's the 5th, so you have the 12th, and then the 19th, so no dinner last month, no dinner in November other than the 19th. We'll have only the first hour, so we will uh, have our meeting at 10, and then we'll have our dinner together. And Miss Linda has been so kind as to have our sign-up sheet out here ready, already for this week. And for next week, so she's put some things on there that we need, so you can put your name beside some of those things and also anything you want to add. The congregation will together bring in turkey and ham. In other words, I'm going to pick it up. So I'll order it and have it picked up. So we don't have to bring the meat, but all the other things, and that'll be our first Thanksgiving dinner of the year. So that'll be on November the 19th. Did I say it right that time? November 19th. All right, so two weeks from today, and I apologize for that. If you're ever up here and you've got to do the talking, you may find that it doesn't come as easy as it looks like. So I said it wrong. There we are, November 19th. Now, I am going to try to cover the same passage I preached on last week. I... Uh, Yes, I didn't do as good a job as I should have and made it difficult, but it's a very difficult passage. And yet I think one that's so important that I don't want us to just stumble over it. So I'm going to try to cover it again, and that is from Hebrews 6. But I want you to begin by looking with me 
in John 6. I'm going to try to illustrate the truth. I'm going to try to illustrate the truth before we look at the truth. I want you to look in John 6. In John 6, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's telling them exactly who he is. And he does it in very literal terms of being the bread from heaven. And they must consume him. And then I want you to look at what it says in verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples. Now if you just looked at that phrase. You would think that that is telling us that there were many who were his true followers. Because they had said, we believe in you. They had professed him. They had made a profession of faith. But when they heard what he was teaching, in verse 60, they said, this is a hard saying. Not hard to understand. Hard to accept. Hard to follow. Uh, you, may, you may talk to friends about... Uh, you know, the things of the gospel, God's election, the definite saving death of Christ. Christ didn't die for everybody. Finally get down to it, didn't die for everybody. He died for the ones that Christ chose. And they may say, well, that's hard. That's hard. And that's the same right out of the Bible. Not hard to understand, but it's hard to accept. And so here are these that look like their disciples. And yet they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can accept this? Who can swallow this? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples, he calls them again disciples, followers, murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Well, I'm not going to read all of it. I just want you to go down to verse 64. Jesus knew from the beginning. What beginning? Well, he knew from the beginning of the world. He knew from the beginning of his coming into the world. He knew from his beginning of calling men. He knew from the beginning of that day. He knew from the beginning, whatever beginning you want to talk about, who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So he said, therefore, I said unto you that no man can come unto me. No man has the ability. That's the word can. Except it were given to him of my father. So what are we being told? These who were called disciples. They made professions of faith. But they didn't come of God's grace. They came for other reasons. And so from that time, again, they're called disciples. Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They committed apostasy. They walked away from him. And then so then Jesus spoke to the twelve in verse 67. And he said, will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, verse 70, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. So he had chosen the eleven to eternal life, but he had chosen the one who was the devil, and of the devil, that was Judas Iscariot, to fulfill the role that he was chosen to. So this illustrates, this illustrates what we see in our text. Then I want you to look with me to another place in Acts chapter 6. So I'm not going to give any more to try to illustrate the point, but I want you to see what it says in Acts chapter 6. And I want you to look, please, at verse number 7, 6 and 7. The Word of God, Acts 6, verse 7, the Word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied, in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. They made a profession of faith. 
they looked as if they were true believers. And that went on. So it was quite a long period of time between that and the writing of the book of Hebrews, though we don't know exactly how long. But I'm very confident that the gospel of God's free, if you go with me to our text now in, John, in Hebrews 6, I'm very confident that God's free and justifying grace in Christ was preached to these Jews and among them. And many of them made their profession, and yet there was a problem that arose. And that problem was that they wanted to join Judaism and Christ. They could see with persuasion that this Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They could see the reasoning of it. But they wanted to join. They didn't want to separate. They wanted to join these two together. And they couldn't seem to depart from their rituals and their laws and their ceremonies and their temples. And so the apostle says to them, if you look in 6.1, let us go on unto perfection. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But he means unto the perfection, the one who has brought about the perfection. He puts it in an impersonal way. It's, it's a noun, not a verb. Let us go on unto the perfection of that which began, that which he calls the first words, called the principles of the doctrine of Christ. It's the first words that concern Christ. He's talking about the things in the, in the Old Testament, the temple and the tabernacle. All those things were first words that concern Christ. God gave them, but they concern Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. Let's go on unto that which is found in Christ alone. Then if you go down, if you just skip, leave everything in the middle from the end of verse 1. He gives us six things. I talked about them last week. If you look in verse 3. And this we will do. We will go on. And this we will do if God permit. So I'm trying to get to verse number 3. But there are a lot of things that surround this that I assume that we need to talk about. The message that had been preached, he calls in verse 13 of chapter 5, he calls it the word of righteousness. The word of righteousness. So rising out of this, this great discourse that's showing that Christ is better than, Christ is superior to, he's, he's superior to all revelation, he's superior to the angels, he's superior to Moses, he's superior to Joshua. He's superior to Aaron and the priesthood. He's superior to the tabernacle and the temple. He's superior to all these things. And rising up out of that, all of a sudden he says, the word of righteousness. It's, it's a mountain peak. Now, some say that he's referring to the righteous character of God. Some say that he's referring to the righteousness of the law. Some say he's referring to the righteousness or to righteousness as a goal for man. But the word of righteousness is a word that speaks of the salvation, the kind that is spoken of, required for sinners, and the one described by Paul most clearly in the book of Romans. And so that's why we go there so often. And this word of righteousness has its own distinctions, but there are some phrases that are virtually synonymous with it. For example, in Acts 14 and verse 3, Luke referred to the word of his grace. And Peter referred to the word of the gospel in Acts 15 and verse 7. And Jesus in Mark uh, 7 and verse 13 referred to the word of God. And Paul in Philippi said the Gentiles heard and were glad and glorified the word of the Lord as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And that's in Acts 13 and verse 48. So he calls it the word of the Lord. 
And then he calls it in 2 Corinthians 6 and 7, the word of truth. He also called it the word of truth we've seen in 2 Timothy 2 and 15. In Philippians, he calls it the word of life. In Colossians 3 and 16, he calls it the word of Christ. In Hebrews 6 and 5, so right down here, he calls it the word of God. Does it have its own distinction to talk about the, the word of righteousness? Well, of certain it does. But it's not set apart from these other things. They all are referring to the gospel. They all are referring to this one gospel. The word righteousness appears 91 times in the New Testament verses. So let me give you some words. Just quickly, I've talked about this many times before with you. Quickly, let me give you eight words that compare to the word of righteousness or we must connect with the word of righteousness. First of all, everlasting. That's the first word. Because thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Tells us in Psalm 119 and 142. It's everlasting because God is its author. It's everlasting because of its purpose before the foundation of the world. And it's everlasting because of its accomplishment. That's what makes it everlasting. The second word I would give you regarding this everlasting, this word righteousness rather, is the little verb bring. Because Daniel said that there was, as a prophecy, there would come a time that there would be something that would finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make a reconciliation for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness. Now these cannot be separated and they occurred at one place, one time, one event at the hand of one man. And of course, that's Christ and his cross. So this everlasting righteousness that God purposed had to be brought in. It wasn't effectual from the foundation of the world. There was no sin for it to cover. There was no transgression to be put away. It had to be brought in. It was brought in one time, one place. When Jesus talked about this same thing, this would be our third word, he used the word fulfill. He said to John the Baptist, it is time for us to fulfill all righteousness. When he says all, he means completely, fully. And he went on to his head to say, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. It's that that is the definition of righteousness. It is the perfect fulfillment of the law. Righteousness resulted there for from the obedience of Christ unto death. He kept every requirement, he fulfilled every condition, and he endured every penalty of the law. What was left was righteousness. Here's the fourth thing. Not only is it everlasting, not only did it have to be brought in, not only did it have to be fulfilled, but the fourth thing is the little phrase, in Him. Righteousness is in Christ, therefore it is outside of me, not to be found in me. And there is no such thing as an imparted righteousness. Scripture says we were made the righteousness or declared the righteousness of God in Him. That's where righteousness is. It's in Him. The fifth word is the word imputed. 4.11 of Romans, that righteousness might be imputed unto them, that's the Gentiles also. That's really what Romans 4 is all about. It's all about telling us that righteousness is, was imputed to those who were Gentiles as well as to Jews. And so by the very truth of imputation, here's what it's telling us. As the entrance of sin had an occasion, the first Adam and the Garden of Eden, as it had an occasion, so the entrance of righteousness had an occasion. The first was in the Garden of Eden, the last was at the cross of Christ. As sin was imputed once, righteousness was imputed once. The first resulted in condemnation. 
The last resulted in justification. The first is related to the disobedience of the first Adam. And the second or the last is related to the obedience of the last Adam. So it had to be imputed. And that imputation was one time. It's not imputed all along as we go, just as sin is not. It was imputed directly in relationship to that obedience unto death. And then the sixth word that I would give you, not only everlasting, had to be brought in, had to be fulfilled. Uh, it, uh, it was in him. It was imputed. And number six, the sixth word would be justification. Now the word justification only appears two times in all of Scripture. And yet if you know the history of the Christian church, Christian history turns upon this one word, justification. But it only appears two times. It appears in the last verse of the fourth chapter of Romans, and it appears in verse 18 of the fifth chapter. And in verse 18, here's what it says. Even so, in other words, comparing it to the, the imputation of sin and the condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, that's Christ, the free gift came upon all men, all kinds of men, all the men that he died for, to the justification of life. So this righteousness resulted in a justification. Here's the seventh word that I would give you, and that is the word gospel. In Romans 1.15 and to 1.17, Paul said, I'm ready to preach the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And then number eight, the word faith, he goes ahead to say in verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So therefore, we know what faith is for. Faith is not a tool to gain what God has for us. So what preachers tell you, if you will take your faith and you will place it in Christ, he'll come into your heart and he'll forgive your sin. That's not what faith is all about at all. Faith is not a tool or an instrument that's in your hand to get God to do something for you. Faith is God-given as a means of revelation to see what he has done. Therefore, by that seeing and that God-given faith, we understand what he has done. Hebrews 11 and 3 and other verses. That's what faith is about. In Galatians 3, verse 6 and 8, it says that God preached the gospel to Abraham and God believed, or Abraham believed the gospel. God preached it to Abraham. Let me say it again. And Abraham believed the gospel. And Abraham's faith was directed where? Not, we're never told that his faith was directed to that, to that, uh, that word that was spoken to him in Genesis 15 and 6 appearing to say that God justified him with righteousness there, but he looked toward Christ. That's what Jesus said. He rejoiced to see my day. Now, why did he rejoice to see the day of Christ? Well, it's because he knew that his justification, his whole salvation, rested in what Christ would accomplish. He saw my day. He rejoiced in it. And they preached what Jeremiah preached. And that is, the Lord is our righteousness. And the apostles and the preachers and the churches, the congregations declared and worshiped according to this word of righteousness. Now the question is, how did all of these priests respond to that message? So I'm going to quickly give you three things. First of all, they were unresponsive. Look in verse 11. It says they were dull of hearing. 5.11. 511. They were dull of hearing. That means they were unresponsive. Now we've all been around people who are hard of hearing. And the harder the hearing is, the more unresponsive they are. You can say something and they may not hear you at all. Or you can say something and they look at you unresponsive to what you're saying because they don't know what you've said. I've never been I, you know, I, this is what I do for a living. Hearing jokes are not funny to me. I, I'm not able to laugh at them because it's a disability. It's, it's a hard disability. It affects the brain. 
It affects, it affects the brain. It affects the mind when people can't hear well. Do you know that people who do not hear well and do not treat their hearing are five times more likely to develop dementia? It's a serious thing not to be able to hear. And what he's telling them is that they were dull of hearing. They were not responsive. That's the first thing. They're unresponsive. And then here's the second thing about them. In verse 13, they were unskillful. The word unskillful, that's not a very good translation of this word. It means they were not experienced in the word of righteousness. They didn't have personal experience in their hearts and minds. It's like those in John 6. They were called disciples. They had made profession, but they, in their hearts and minds, no experience. Same thing in Romans 10 that we looked at last week. This is beyond immaturity and maturity. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about stunted, unnatural growth. He's talking about a, a hearing, but a, not a growth in experience to go on into it. And this is uh, illustrated by what Jesus said concerning the seed that goes into the ground and it shoots up and it looks like they're a believer, but there's no deepness in the earth, and so it says they withered away. And so these men and women heard the message of Christ, wanted to join it together. They shot up as if they were believers, but then they withered away. Unresponsive and undeveloped. And one more thing he gives as a picture of them. Go down to chapter 6 and verse 1. And it's the word leaving. And the word leaving is a word that is a picture word of a ship sitting in a dock, in a harbor rather. And they're tied to the dock. And it's time for them to go on away from the harbor and do what a ship is supposed to do. That ship is to carry goods or pick up goods. The wind is right, the water is right, the time is right, everything is right. It's perfect. But they don't leave the harbor. Now, why don't they leave the harbor? Well, we're not told why. It might be family. It could be that uh, a husband doesn't want to come, so the wife won't leave. It could be the wife is not going to give in, so the husband won't come. It could be a family issue. It could be they're tied to their former religion. It could be business. If they leave and go to a small congregation where the truth is preached, they lose business context. Maybe fear, maybe persecution, but I suspect that the marina is just very attractive. Real pretty there. Very comfortable. It's nice being in the boat, have those gentle waves rocking you back and forth. But to go on out to sea, to go on into what a ship is supposed to be, they do not do that. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. They had heard it that even made a profession of faith regarding it. But they didn't go on. So that's the picture that we have here. Uh, it is said, So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsakes not all that he has cannot be my disciple. Had those in John 6 forsaken all? No, but they're called disciples. So he then tells them what the problem is. And he says to them, I want you to look in 6.1. Therefore, considering those that were uh, unresponsive and those that were undeveloped, therefore leaving, let us leave the harbor of the first things that were said concerning Christ. He means the things of the Old Testament. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. Let us go on into perfection. Let us go on into perfection. That is that which is perfect concerning Christ. It isn't perf perfect knowledge, but it is the word completeness. It is that which completed that of the Old Testament. What of the Old Testament were shadows and types has now been completed and fulfilled. That's what perfection is, not perfection of knowledge. Then he gives the list of those six things that I'm not going back through again, and he said this we will do if God Permits. I'm going to come back to verse 3. But from verse 4 down through verse 9, he 
interweaves in here two groups of people. It's very important that you see that he's talking about two groups of people. Some who heard, made a profession of faith, but did not go on. Others who heard and did go on. So let me talk about, first of all, those who did not go on. Those who are dull of hearing, those who are unskillful, those who remain in the harbor. The first thing about them, we find two verses about them in verse 6 and verse 8. If they shall fall away, meaning they heard, they made a profession of faith, but if they fall away, to renew them again. What does he mean by the word again? In other words, they've already made their profession. They've already considered the gospel. But it was not in their experience. It's not in their heart. They're unresponsive. They didn't leave the harbor. If they fall away, they turn back to renew them again unto repentance. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. I think that means that Christ would have to die all over again for them if they were to be truly saved. In other words, they've rejected the one salvation that's in Christ Jesus. They rejected that one. That one's been preached to them thoroughly, completely, earnestly, prayerfully preached to them. They've talked about it. They've considered it. And they've rejected it. They've fallen away from it. The only other option would be that there would have to be another death. They've rejected the first one. Then go down to verse 8. Still talking about these that fall away. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. There's nothing left for them but judgment. They've rejected that. So I talked with you in the first hour a little bit about the fact that they, in their religion, was like being addicted. That's what Paul's example is. It's like being addicted to alcohol. Didn't talk about drugs. Same thing in our day. Those who are addicted to alcohol and drugs have an awfully hard time recovering from it. And the same thing with recovering from being addicted to false religion. And he says, he says that it's uh, not something that is going to happen and we have no examples of it happening. So that's one group of people here. They fall away. But then there are others who are responsive. They have experience with this word of righteousness and they leave the harbor. They go on. Now what about them? Well, we also have three verses that concern them, or four verses. Verse 4 and 5, it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. So what do you think about that word impossible? It means exactly what it says. It is impossible for those who are once enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come. Let me stop here for a minute. First of all, they're enlightened. That's the sense of sight. And that is being spiritually reborn. So to be enlightened is the sense of sight. The second thing he says is they tasted the heavenly gift. What's another sense? Taste, of course. And that heavenly gift, that must be the gospel. In Revelation, it refers to uh, him commanding John to take the little book which is, represents the gospel and eat it up. And he said it'll be as sweet to your mouth as honey. So, sense of sight, sense of taste. And then he also says, partakers of the Holy Spirit. I think that is the sense of feel. It's the sense of awareness that you can actually feel and know that you've been awakened. You're not like you once were. You cannot go back to where you were. You cannot let go of what you're holding to. You cannot fall away because it's, it's in you. You sense it and you know it. In verse 5, and have tasted, he goes back to the sense of taste again, 
tasted the good word of God. I think when he talks about tasted the good word of God, he's talking about the digestion of the truth. You've not only taken it into your mouth, you've not only, not only has it been upon your palate, but you've swallowed it. Now it's down in your system, and it's down inside of you. So you have the sense of taste, and sight, and feel, and now digestion. It's down inside of you, the good word of God, this gospel, this doctrine of truth. So these are the things that describe the one that has gone on. Now in verse 7, he gives a parable-like saying concerning them, for the earth which drinks in the rain that comes off upon it and brings forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from above. That's the one that's responsive. That's the one who has, who has uh, uh, experience in 513 and the one who leaves the harbor. He's like the earth. He soaks it in. And then also verse 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. What does he mean by that? He means better things of you than them, as in verse 6, that fall away. So obviously you have two groups of people here. One group of people, those that fall away. The other group of people, he says, they concern you. He said, if with this we will do, if God permit. If God permit. So let me talk about that a minute. I know I'm a little long, but I'll stop. He who has begun a work, good work in you will do what? Perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1, 5. Philippians 2 and 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, Psalm 110 and verse 3. And this word permission right here is not a good translation. It's actually the word turn, if God turn you. And Jeremiah said, Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed. He turned Abel, but he didn't turn Cain. He turned Noah, but he left the rest of the world. He turned Abel or Abraham, but he didn't turn all the Chaldeans. He turned Isaac, but he didn't turn Ishmael. He turned Jacob, but he didn't turn Esau. He turned David, but he didn't turn his family. He turned the eleven, but he didn't turn Judas Iscariot. So the Proverbs say the hearing ear and the seeing eye and the Lord hath made even both of them. And Jesus left the rich young ruler after the disciples were exceedingly amazed. He said, with men it's impossible. In other words, with the rich young ruler it was not possible for him to come. But he said, with God all things are possible. He could have done it. That's what it means. If God turns him. Jesus didn't turn him. Not on that occasion, at least. So I conclude with this verse. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, Jude one twenty four, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. This we will do. This we will go on to that which is perfection, that which is in Christ Jesus, and it is impossible for those who go on to turn away. The rest will hear, they'll consider, and they'll turn away. We've seen enough folks to come through our little congregation. I've preached the same message for years. How many have heard and turned away? There's something about the harbor that's too appealing. We love to sing Weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus only is our surety. Full of pity, love and power, come ye sinners poor and needy. To stand and sing in our, in our folders. I didn't write down, is it number 11? 8? 8? 11. Folks, number 8, 11. To stand and sing. Number 11, please. Let's sing the verses and then the chorus one time. All right, if you found number 11 in your folders, please stand with me.
thing come and welcome God's free bounty glorify true belief and true repentance every grace that brings you nigh come ye Have a great week.